Welcome. Welcome to our library lecture tonight. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley School of Craft, and I am delighted to be uh, presenting tonight uh, our library lecture series in partnership with the Pike County Library, funded through a grant from the Greater Pike County Community Foundation and the Richard L. Snyder Fund. Our partnership and the support helps bring these programs. And tonight we are really, really excited to welcome Ellie Richards. I know that a few people are still popping in. Um, let's see, 35 people coming in. So welcome as we allow everybody to join us. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Ellie. I first met Ellie in, I think it was 2012, when she came to Peters Valley School of Craft, fresh out of grad school from Arizona State University. And Ellie is currently a furniture designer and sculptor based in North Carolina. She's interested in the role the furniture and domestic objects play in creating opportunities for a deeper connection between people and their sense of place. Ellie looks to the tradition of both woodworking and the ready-made to create eclectic assemblage, installation, and objects exploring intersections of labor, leisure, community, and culture. She maintains an active teaching schedule, sharing the fundamentals of woodworking and artistic practice with the breadth of audience, including appointments at Yestermorrow Design Build School, Appalachian Center for Craft, Haystack Mountain School of Craft, and Peters Valley. She is currently a resident artist at Penland School of Craft from 2020 to 2023. So welcome Ellie Richards. Hi Kristen. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are we all set? We are all set. I think you can share your screen. Okay. Um share screen. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We're so happy to have you. And what, um, if you have questions, you can pop them into the chat and um, I will, I'm sorry, I forgot about it. I'm a little rusty. Before Ellie begins, we do have at the um, bottom of the screen, if you hover over, there's a little box called chat. Um, so you can put, um, comments in there and we'll put information in there. And then if you have questions, put them in the Q and A and we'll answer them at the end of the lecture. Good deal. Um, yeah, and also I'm, an, uh, I'm open to fielding those questions if they're appropriate, you know, in the middle of everything too. So you use, use your judgment. Um, and thank you so much to Peters Valley and for everyone that's here, it's right before the holiday season. So I appreciate your time and um, yeah, just your, um, you investing in this lecture tonight. Um, I was really excited to hear from Peters Valley. I always am. Um, as Kristen said, she, um, Peters Valley sort of hired me right out of grad school and I always attribute them to sort of taking a chance on me before, you know, I really had much of a resume to speak of and she kind of just, yeah, believed in me. And I never, I always remember that and think of Peters Valley fondly. Um, had one of the best summers of my life working there as a, as a technical assistant and enjoying the, a lot of that was because of how beautiful it is there. So if you have not been, I encourage your attendance at that school. So um, furthermore, tonight's lecture is just a brief intro of my work. And then I'm going to dive deeper into uh, an experience I had back in 2018, traveling to Ghana to study um, the tradition of fantasy coffin making and how that sort of has influenced my work. Um, this lecture is based on sort of, it was prompted by how do my travel experiences influence my work? And I chose that one as a sort of feature of tonight. But um, my my thoughts on travel are, are that it's, it's something that always stays with you. It's an experience um, that uh, doesn't it doesn't fade. Um, it evolves in your mind as a memory, um, but those experiences stay with you. Unlike, um, you know, maybe the the objects that you buy when you're when you're traveling, sometimes those will fade away or 
exit your life gracefully, but the experience of travel is just something that doesn't take up space, but you can always revisit. And I love that when I'm in the studio, I can always use my imagination and my memories to travel to these places that I've been and, and beyond. And um, I'm hoping that you catch a little bit of that spirit in my talk tonight. So just to get you acquainted with my work, I do make furniture um, and I design furniture. I use color and uh, the application of paint and, and different media to bring life to basic furniture forms. Um, I really uh, believe in the tradition of furniture making and, but I also come from an art school background. And so these mer the merging of fine craftsmanship and uh, sort of artistic expression, um, I'm, I'm sort of always looking for furniture to, uh, and sculptural objects to sort of have that space of both, both of wonderful exuberant gestures and then also the structure and tradition and integrity of a well-made um, object in wood. And so you can see these slides that I'm flipping through are just examples of ways that I've taken wood and applied color and texture and interactivity. This is a rocking chair that's a labyrinth um, that you sort of instead of sitting on, you stand behind and operate a little steel ball through the through that maze there. Um, I enjoy bringing groups of people together to make things. And while I was a coordinator at Penland, I organized with um, a, a few other colleagues, a fun day called Table in a Day. And this was a, a nine hour event where we would make a piece of furniture. And these are examples from that day. And I also am a big collaborator. These are two collaborations with furniture designers, Christina Boy on the left and Annie Evelyn on the right. And I always am looking for opportunities to expand my, um, my design sensibilities and technical uh, sensibilities with another person's and find that the outcomes are always um, just well, well worth it, well worth it. So, um, I wanted to make sure that you had a sense of what my work kind of looked at so that you would know why it was important to me to put together a proposal to travel to Ghana to study this very specific um, form of coffin making that I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but just a couple of key things to remember. Uh, the scale of my work, furniture is something that the body can engage with fully. It's human scale. And there's something that close relationship of the human body to a form is um, really sort of, I don't know, um, that that charges me, that 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 gives me something to, um, it sort of reminds me of a playground and, and that furniture is something that you constantly engage with during your day to day. Um, but sometimes it, it sort of fades into the background. And so I'm looking to bring furniture into the foreground and, and looking for um, ways that you can less passively um, have it in your life. How can it be integrated into your life so that it's less of a passive thing that you're just sitting in and ignoring and maybe more like maybe it's inciting energy and bringing more to uh, your living spaces. Um, and so this is an installation of light up chairs that you sort of walk around and they are motion censored and they light up and throb with light as, as you move through them. And here's a couple of other shots. So I wanted you to keep in mind the scale of furniture. I wanted you to keep in mind, um, uh, as I'm talking about these coffins, the uh, color and the application of media on wood. That's a really important thing that I'm uh, kind of always researching and um, and then uh, just cultural practice and um, the role of uh, of tradition in 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 each person's lifestyle so um, let's get started on sort of introducing you to these fantasy coffins in Ghana when a person passes um, there are a lot of ways that a, a the, the community can respond and respectfully sort of honor that person's life. One of them in Ghana is the creation of these, these large scale coffins that take on um, sort of lifelike forms. Um, so here we're looking at a large elephant and basically the body is 
housed in a large form that is exemplifying something of that person's life. So for instance, this is a large fish coffin. Um, you can see that it opens up here into a coffin form. And this person may have been a fisherman um, or something dealing with, and, you know, in Ghana, it's a coastal town. So there's a lot of <laughs> fish coffins. But basically what I'm trying to say is that these coffins took on um, something that was honorable or celebrated about that person's life. And coffins themselves and the funerary practices in Ghana were celebrations themselves. And so uh, in going there, it was sort of interesting to me the difference in how, you know, Western cultures uh, deal with death and then how in, in Africa, in Ghana, there was this very different approach and it intrigued me and sort of aligned with how I wanna move forward thinking about death and, and passing is that I really wanna think of it as a way, as a moment to celebrate um, and a moment to honor. And of course there's mourning and of course there's grief. And there's just this sort of, in, the, in these forms I've found such joy and just such, um, it's, it's a party there. The, the funerals are literal parties. Um, and I think that these coffins play a big part in that. When I went there, um, I went there, sorry, uh, uh, I went there with the help of Eric Ajate Nam, who's a coffin maker and sculptor in Ghana, um, but he has traveled to the US to do residencies. And this is a picture of Eric and he currently lives in Madison, Wisconsin. And he travels to also speak about this tradition and makes coffins for big museum collections and uh, on commission. So he sent me there. He was in um, the States working on getting his visa. So he sent me there on trust and um, hooked me up with his family. And here are, you know, his family members that I was able to stay with. And that's Gifty and her son and her mother. And they took me in for a month. And um, during that month, I stayed at her house and she fed me and we worked together and cleaned and did all of the house chores. And then I would go to work each day, which was at the, um, basically a wood shop in, in the downtown area of Accra. So here I am um, getting straight to it. When I got there, um, you know, there's big language barrier, um, but there was an understanding that I was there to come and learn and do hands-on work. And so they put me to work carving these wheels and um, I didn't really know a lot of what to expect, but it's very uh, laid, I wouldn't say it was laid back. It was just, you can see we're wearing flip-flops and there's no power tools. And so I just sort of like jumped into this, this frame. It was also very hot. And so like my clothing, I kind of like over the first few days had to really sort of absorb what they were doing and follow suit. And so, and, and acclimate to this workshop environment that I, I really wasn't used to at all. Um, mainly because there really was only one power source and that was to generate a, a spray gun for, for painting the finishes. So everything chisels um, and here's these wheels that we put on. These coffins are made entirely of, of green wood that is, you know, locally sourced. And so they're made, um, let's see if I can find, here we are working on one, uh, a truck, these like big uh, shipping container trucks. Um, and so they're made of green wood. So keep in mind, you know, wood moves and um, as it's drying, it, you know, shrinks. And, um, you know, there's a time sensitivity here because, you know, when the celebration occurs for a person, they're actually put into this coffin and then, you know, there's a, a party surrounding it and then it, it does go into the ground. So in that period of time, you know, the coffin has to be freshly made. Um, and it has a little, little bit of a shelf life because after that green wood that's not dried properly uh, or kiln dried as they would you know at lumber yards here in the states the wood cracks and that that finish the bondo and the spackle that sealed all of the seams of these large forms 
begins to separate. So what you're looking at here is, you know, the spackling and bondo process. Making these coffins was very much like auto body work. There was a lot of like sort of smearing on of a paste and sanding it back. And it's very much almost like set design. Um, so you're, you're making it for the moment and it's the big show. And so a lot of it's um, an, an illusion in a way. Uh, it also very much relates to the upholstery world because on the interiors, they're sort of covering these in elaborate fabrics and so forth. And so this was one of the first ones we went, went in on and uh, it was a big, uh, you know, it was, I, like I said, they're time sensitive. So here we are at night, you know, painting on those, those last details and waiting for pickup the next morning and um, sort of see some before and after. Yeah. So uh, as I said, um, Accra, the capital of Ghana, is right on the coast. And so it's a big shipping and fishing port. And so that's the shipping containers and the fish coffins and so forth. And so one of the things that interested, that sort of, I don't know, uh, led my research when I was there was, how, you know, how does place inform this product and, and the sort of merging of the process of, of making these um, and, and the place of them. And then uh, like, I guess it's the process, the product and the place are the three big words that I'm like sort of using as my focus for this. And the place was, uh, you know, here's here we are on the coast. And another big tradition is the sort of making of these carving of these vessels. So there was also this big culture of um, boat making there. And I wanted to be sure to understand the process of both the coffin making and other woodworking furniture related practices um, in this place to kind of understand the approach more fully. And so we did visit these shipyards to understand, you know, what, how are they engaging with these, again, quite large objects with not a lot of large power tools. And um, I was really struck by just the immense amount of handwork and resourcefulness down to, you can see this man standing on a, a board above two tires. And this level of resourcefulness was carried through the entire product. And that, that was really inspiring to me to know that um, through sheer tenacity and virtue, um, that these these large things came to life with so much character. I included this picture of a puzzle because on our night's home, we would I brought this puzzle as a gift and it was like a, a thousand piece or something. But me and Gifty, you know, not having a lot of shared language, we would work on this puzzle and it became a bonding experience for us. Um, and you know, the uh, drama of getting a puzzle together. Um, and so I'll jump in a little bit to the process. Here we have, um, you know, simple tools, a uh, pencil, a scribe, and, and, and no, um, I, was sh I was sort of so impressed by the amount of precision and the amount of finesse with such crude materials and tools. To me, I say crude, not as an insult, but just as a sort of scale of comparison. Um, I'm sometimes seeing chisels with mirrored finishes and there in Ghana, there's you know, a sharpening stone that was sort of worn to a curve from how often it was used, but there was such a finesse and just a quick sharpening and, and a fluidity and, and keeping tools working, but you might look at them and say, oh, they don't look all that, um, cared for, or maybe they look a little like they just fell on the ground. They don't have that like sort of, I don't know, uh, flamboyant sort of persona as a lot of people in the United States can keep their tools to a sort of level of, I don't know, sort of like photogenic <laughs> quality. But here it's like, it's just about the use and, and, and its function. And I was um, always, having to tell myself that just because this tool doesn't look as pretty as you're used to doesn't mean that its um, function is anything less. And if it was, that had to do with me. Um, 
And so just a, another note on the resourcefulness of, of, the, of the process of making these, you know, some of the boards were recycled um, from other, you know, buildings and the nails a lot. One, several days I was just extracting nails out of wood. And so pounding these nails out of wood and then pounding them straight and then putting them back into the coffins themselves. And here's a couple of the employees of this particular coffin shop that that was hosting me. Oh, and this is also to say that they not only make the fantasy coffins, which take on these the sort of larger, more fun, you know, shapes, they also do traditional coffins. And there was really no distinction of value between them, but this is one of the more traditional coffins. Everything was nailed. Oh, here's a video. So um, I don't know if you heard that, but they are constantly playing amazing music. And these are sort of, it's sort of allowed a lot of hammering and hand planing. And there's no glue used in these coffins, not the fantasy ones, nor the traditional ones. And um, the only sort of like extra media would be paint and spackle. And so um, I found that kind of fascinating too, that like everything here was, is just a sort of scar, uh, sort of miter joint. Um, so two angled edges meeting precisely that that's achieved with a hand plane and then um, is nailed together. One of my big questions going there was how do how how do these coffins get made? They're they're hollow form, so I can understand you know the process of making a table with joinery, um, but how do you make a hollow closed form on such a large scale without uh, you know drawings or or power tools? That was a big mystery to me, and I I went there trying to figure that out. Like how did that fish come to be? How did that curve happen? And what don't I know that I could utilize in my own sculptural work to um, achieve that. You know, you're just seeing here different steps. There was a lot of sweeping, sawing, uh, sanding. Um, these saws were incredibly sharp and used to cut all of the pieces. Um, if you've ever been in a wood shop before, you know that there's rip cuts that you can make that run the long length of the board. And then there are cross cuts, which are the short length of the board. And rip cuts are usually done on the bandsaw or the table saw, which you push the material through. Well, here there aren't there aren't those, um, and so you can see here they're using those saws, and the wood is stationary, and it's all muscle work all the way down the board. And so I did not last long on that exercise, and <laughs> they didn't want to waste any time or money on me doing that. But I I did try it and can only speak to how how much practice it would take and how much muscle it, it does take to do this cut. Another thing I witnessed was this really interesting stamping spackling tool that they would use to stamp all the way around the coffin to create interesting textures and then also just apply the material. So here's an image of, of that happening. So these coffins start off in this raw wood and these various shapes, but then uh, take off into um, these other worldly um, sort of textures and colors, starting with this sort of, it's almost like icing a cake. Um, and, you know, I told you to keep in mind a few things. Uh, the, one of them was a scale of, of these coffins and, and what it took from the body to um, make them. Uh, I really love being in the studio and there being moments where I can really activate my whole sort of physical sense when I'm making something. And that was really sort of awakened in me when I was in Ghana, which was you really had to straddle these, these things once they started getting larger to achieve the work that, that needed to be done. And I, I just think there's such a commitment there and such a, um, uh, it's, it's empowering. It's, it's, it's very, it sort of renews your passion and what you're doing and, and gets you all in the moment when each part of you, not just your hands or maybe not just your arms are asked to show up to, to, to accomplish a task. And so there's a lot of labor involved and, and 
here I found that uh, labor to to hold a lot of integrity and um, and and the body was a reflection of that as you can see um, you know the sort of his muscles are just like super toned and it just it was incredible to watch and um, I was pretty sore after after being there for a few days um, here's an image of it, it might be a video just sanding down the bondo to create these smooth surfaces again sort of like an auto auto body shop and here it is with the different layers of of bondo in there and I, I told you there was one source of power and it was only to serve the generator uh the, sorry the air compressor which um you know powered the spray gun so here's the thing that we plugged in and there it is being used to apply primer and then other layers of color, in this case, gold. And then came the embellishments, the sort of finishings and trappings of a coffin. And uh, I went to one of the markets in, uh, in the downtown area and there's just a sort of stores and stores filled with the corner these sort of corner elements and the handles for coffins and so there's all sorts of choices and here was one of them here's a picture of um this this moment in in the making of the coffins where you build it and then you kind of cut it apart so that you can add hinges and do the upholstery properly. So here's that moment where you sort of constructed the box and started to paint it, but then you're like going in and, and, and sort of dissecting it again. And those of you who maybe follow my work a little bit more know that I do this a lot um, in the practice of making a, a bandsaw box, which is starting with something solid and then dissecting it and then gluing it back together with a new formation and purpose. Here's the upholstery process. Again, like using, you know, uh, scraps of fabric for hinges and using every last bit of foam to fill uh, the interior. And then came this sort of special, uh, I, I forget the word for it, but sort of scrunched fabric for the interior. And then they would wrap the coffins and they'd be picked up for delivery and um and taken off and that whole exchange was really quick you know um uh just as quickly as the client called in the coughing was made and then out the door for delivery but there wasn't a lot of sentimental sort of oh we just made this amazing thing and it feels great let's celebrate it was no let's on to the next goodbye and it, it was all moved very quickly and the sort of um what I was experiencing as like um, this sort of arc of experience and wanting like sort of celebration and closure. It was just in the continuum for them. And it was, um, I had to kind of swallow a little bit and say, okay, like um, it's not what this is about for them. This is a, a business, um, it's a vocation and um, it's their job. And so you didn't have like the sort of I'm, I'm in a place of privilege to be able to view it as um, this sort of really powerful um, thing that they're doing. Um, and so there it is in a truck on its way out. And there it is, uh, there's one of the, the graveyards that I was able to visit. And if you can imagine, you know, procession here and, you know, carrying of these coffins out into a really simple graveyard. Again, I was struck by just how plain it was you know there's nothing special about this you might even walk by and not know it was a graveyard so um kind of viewing where i am with my slides um i have some pictures here of more of the boat yards and the shipyards i would love getting out on the weekends and doing um some sort of exploration to a close by town um, I even found across the street um, this other coffin shop, Imported Caskets, and found it kind of comical that like, oh my gosh, like we're over here like sweating and like working so hard and doing everything by hand. And even across the street, there was Imported Caskets ready to go. And so there is a spectrum of, you know, cultural practice there as well. Um, 
And so here's some of the, yeah, what we were trying to maybe create. <laughs> and um, also a really interesting uh, moment in these coffins was a place for stored ashes. And this is a vial that lived in one of those coffins for, for the remains. Um, everything was sort of hand painted and I loved seeing these, the signages and, um, and then coming back to the shop and seeing how that sort of imagery played into the coffin design. And this was a, a chainsaw coffin. So maybe for a lumber, someone who worked at a lumber yard or something like that. So of course I was super jazzed to be working on this one. Loved seeing the sort of uh, graphic details come to life. They actually hire in subcontract a sign painter um, for that to kind of come in. And I did find another wood shop close by when we went to go buy the wood that we were using and took some pictures of them working as well, just sort of buried in sawdust and using these machines that even I'd be scared to approach, but they used with so much confidence and um, skill. So there are power tools there, just not in the coffin making shops. There really wasn't a need for them. And this is us wheeling the wood back to uh, the workshop. I told you I went to one of those markets to purchase the extra embellishments. And this is the Makala market in Accra, um, which I found incredibly inspiring with just the motion and movement and commerce of color. We pick up sandpaper and I got my own hand plane there. And um, here's another image of sort of I would walk to work on some days and pass this man with his workbench just outside. And I thought to myself, that's all you need. Um, and let's just take a moment to, to play I spy um, in this image. You're, you're gonna see in the very center top of it, there's a pair of safety glasses hanging from the branch. And um, in this moment, I find a lot of things culminating, just a sense of resourcefulness, a sense of, um, place using what you have um, and, and a sort of completeness in, in this, in this um, uh, space that this man has created for himself. Um, so I'm gonna move through these a little bit. This is one of the fish coffins. I think, yeah. Um, you can see where the seam is on this one. It's sort of right down the middle and that opens up and um, becomes a space. And then we have dinner. <laughs> um, these fish would get fried and they were distributed and they were delicious snacks at the end of the day. And I told you I wanted to figure out how these were made um, with, uh, without drawings and without plans. And I'm so used to seeing technical drawings with measurements and planning everything out ahead of time. And I kept waiting for that, but then thinking, I don't, I don't think it exists here. And, and it doesn't, it's very, um, it's a built system of knowledge. And so it's passed on to you. And it starts with sometimes just a drawing in the dirt. And so what I'm walking you through here is the creation of a tomato. And so it starts out with this kidney bean shaped being drawn right onto the ground and then these segments of wood being shaped to mimic that drawing. And then that sort of profile or that outline or contour is used to build up the volume of, of the form. And so here we are sort of arcing, making that first arc. And this is, this is a tomato, this is one half of a tomato. So we're starting, we're building in two halves. And each of these parts were um, <clears throat> you know, put together with uh, nails and the correct angle. And um, I, this was the part that I was so intrigued to find out, you know, how do you make this multi sort of contoured object in solid flat pieces of wood. And so it does start off very much, very faceted and each piece is cut to you, you cut each piece to the next. And so there are no shortcuts. Um, you just get faster is what you do. But in order to, to get to the end, you, you must go along in this, in this way where you're, you're sizing each piece to the one before it. And, and that was a main 
takeaway, you know, down to the very last little wedge um, that these things, but here's a finished piece of it. You know, it's been spackled, it's been sanded and hand planed and all of that, and then put a glossy finish on. So here's all of the tools that were used to make that tomato coffin. Ellie? Yeah. How Oh, that's amazing. Generally, how long does it take to make a coffin? Um, that's a good question. I think anywhere from about uh, five to 10 days. Wow. Yeah, it's really quick. So, you know, a couple, yeah, they, they made that whole, um, the two halves in a morning, you know, um, so it, it happens fast, not as fast as the time-lapse video, but um, it's, it's, it'll shock you. Yeah. I included some, you know, when I was traveling around, you you on this in, in Ghana or in Accra, you'll see coffin shop after coffin shop. It's it's a um, city industry. And so there are compete, there's competition. Um, and I went and visited and sort of interviewed other shops. And um, one thing they would do is bring out the photo books and show me some of their prized, you know, coffins. And so you can kind of tell on the edge of one of these pictures, it's it's a photo book. Um, and that was their, that's their sort of marketing and sort of website, if you will. And so I'd take pictures of their pictures and that's what you're looking at here. I took ones of, you know, wood related tools and sort of stuff I'm interested in, but uh, here's some fun ones. And that's me in one of the old coffins that was just lying around and I got to wear a really special garment made by a tailor seamstress there. Um, and I thought, I brought those this tank top home with me as a sort of token and memory and uh, yeah, just love to see that. I'm gonna skip through this one. Um, I want to share, I want to sort of end my presentation um, with a little bit of show and tell. Um, and I apologize for skipping through that, but this is mainly where I wanna end. Um, is how does all how does that experience you know we're now maybe three years out from that maybe more hard to tr keep track of time these days but how does you know this is now a couple of years ago and it's still um i'm still processing it i still get to travel through you know even this presentation awakens certain things in me and reminds me of things that i want to try in the studio and things that are meaningful to me and one piece that i did sort of reach a a sort of meeting of the experience to uh, a new piece was in this one, which is a constructed sort of um, torso shaped object that utilize those techniques, but on a smaller scale. And so this will be fun. I wonder if how big you think this is, and then I can just show you in person. Is it, oh wait, I should probably stop sharing my screen. Anyways, here's the piece, um, it's made with little pieces all connected, it's hollow and um, used just on a smaller scale of what we did. So I'm gonna stop sharing, uh, stop share. Are we all clear on that? Am I back on? You're back on, you're all good. Okay, back on. good deal. Um, so, all right, so here's this piece and it's called Basket Casket um, and it is, uh, in the round, it's very light because it's hollow, um, but it also functions as a basket as well. And you can see that each inside here is just a little grid work of each of these pieces that were cut and then hand planed um, to a particular angle, similar to coopering, if you're familiar with that. But then it gets really wild whenever you're doing like um, sort of curves that go in and exit in different directions. And so that was a challenging part of this one. And then, um, yeah, I just uh, felt like I needed to absorb what I learned there, but do it on a smaller scale. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. It worked for me in my studio. So we'll see, maybe that's the beginning of a series or maybe it's just sort of a one-off thing, but um, that's sort of where all of this landed. Um, and I'd be super down to field any questions or anything um, about that. There's a few. Um, thank you, Ellie. Oh my gosh, 
you're so articulate with such a special experience. Oh, thank you. Um, some questions we have is, when did you go, go to Ghana and how long were you there? I think it was 2018 and it was a month. And prior to that, my friend, my very good friend, Betsy DeWitt and I um, did some traveling before. So I sort of, you know, when I travel, um, yeah, you, I try to get the most out of it. And so I think we went to, um, we went to Morocco and then, and then down to Ghana and um, there was, maybe one other thing in there that I'm, I'm escaping, but it, it was so stretched out. This was maybe a, about a two month experience where um, I'm out of the States and sort of really immersed in, in, in this other place. So, yeah. So this question is from Rebecca McGee Tuck and uh, you may have answered it already, but it says, I'm wondering maybe, will you address this? Do they bury these artworks, burn them or are they just for show? Good question. They bury them. They get buried. Um, the only ones that are for show are at the shops. There'll be like galleries so that you can showcase your work because as I said, it was a competition. There is competition. And so having your best um, coffins on display is, uh, is, is, is a benefit. And the other thing is, is sometimes they'll build the coffins all the way up until before painting them. And then they'll sit there for a while. So maybe someone knows that they want to order like a shoe coffin. They will have that pre-made up to the painting because once you paint, then the shelf life starts and the wood can expand and contract and ruin the paint job. Interesting. So how, um... How many coffins were produced simultaneously? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe, you know, the shop was quite small. It was just sort of like a shed in a way, like a uh, slanted shed. And so there wasn't a ton of space, but there was always a coffin tucked away somewhere um, in all the different corners. So I would say about six, you know, going on at the same time, somewhere in there. Nice. Um, another question, were you the only woman in the shop and were there any issues with being a woman in a mm. coffin? Are there yeah. coffin makers? Yeah. That's a good question. I, you know, I kind of, I was the only woman working in that shop. I think that they had had another uh, female intern at one point and yeah, you know, um, we just laughed at it a little bit in the beginning, you know, like, oh, I, there was times when the people who worked there, their girlfriends would come and then they would ask, how is she doing? Is she doing okay? And I could tell that it was one of those moments where like, they didn't think that I was, they sort of doubted that I was there trying to work or they didn't quite understand it. Or it was more the other women there that were like, didn't quite, you know, didn't quite sit with them. Like what? Like they, it didn't make sense. Um, and so it was then that I kind of had the harder time, like just saying like, this is what I do and this is why I'm here. Um, but the other employees, I was so impressed with just their, let's just work, let's just get to it sort of thing. Um, but it was, it was also something that we could laugh at too and just say like, yeah, I'm this random girl from the States that just wants to learn this thing and <laughs> let's just laugh about it and, and get into it. So, yeah. So another was, are, are these for full? Because you file for ashes um, for one of the coffins. And so. Um, could you say that question one more time? I had a bit of a cut out there. Sorry, it, it sort of cut out. Um, were these coffins for whole bodies or for ashes? They were for whole bodies. Yeah. Okay. Also. How much do they cost? Are they very expensive? <laughs> yeah, and I wish I had a clear answer for that, but that was one of the things that I could not get to the bottom of. Um, there would be clients coming and there would be, there was a lot of drama sometimes. Like the clients would come and say, why isn't it done yet? Or, you know, no, I wanted it this way. Or it would be about money sometimes. And the economy there is very much bartering and like uh trades and who knows who and there's so much that it was really hard for me to decode what the value of these was 
Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have like anything even like accurate to report. Like, was it close to 300 or it's just like a really different value system. But I will say that I, I think that they're less than what we think they would be. Um, I think that like, or, or like if this were, if this whole um, business was translated to the States, um, I think that the price would be much more inflated than it is there in Ghana. Like, I think it's more every day sort mm -hmm. of thing. Right. That makes sense. Um, are they all one-offs or are they a line? Like Ooh. the designs? <laughs> Yeah, they're all one of a kind. So the only thing that there is there is that, you know, there's several different styles. Like you saw the traditional one, you saw the multi sort of the tomato one, which is sort of almost like spherical uh, in the round, we'll say. And then there's another one where it's more like linear, like the truck. Um, so there is within those three categories, you can sort of design within those as as your framework so there there's sort of that nice um and sashka ross says i've always planned to be cremated but ellie you're giving me second thoughts <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's pretty interesting i always was thinking to myself what would i choose i don't know <laughs> maybe a pencil or something <laughs> yeah um Tamara Harris is asking, did you look at woodworking in Morocco as well? I did. Um, yes, very much. Um, I have another sample. Oh yeah, I one thing I, I wanted to show too is I have these like maquettes that were like miniature versions of the coffins. So this was from Ghana and it was a, a little small truck that was, you know, just laying around, but I like to have it. And then when I was in Morocco, I got this as one of my sort of takeaways, which was a finial for a building that's sort of all made of these triangular pieces. But this is something, you know, you just don't learn from a book. And um, I also didn't need to shove this in my luggage and bring it home with me. I could have taken a picture, but like I I get so much from, from having this. And I this is another thing that I'll do something like this, interpret this in my own way and that that is yet to come but it sits on my shelf and awaits that <laughs> so neat um so um let's see another question from Jeannie Everhart hi Jeannie is are the coffins pre-ordered by the individual or the family um, so. oh uh so are they pre-ordered by the individual oh both either or um eh, yeah, if, if the individual has a status that, you know, um, they have a high status in the family, a high rank in the family, and they're maybe the main provider, then they will do that for themselves. Um, but maybe if it's someone else, like, uh, who knows, a different person in the family that might be not the patriarch or the matriarch, the family would pull together resources and and do that for it for the family member. Oh, great. So I think that answers a bunch of questions about that. Like who does the negotiating? I guess it all depends. You can't plan these things always, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's there's room for that negotiation there. Um, yeah. Nice. So Diane Charnoff is, says, fantastic talk, Ellie. Thank you. Glenn Gilmore says, wonderful, with a bunch of smiley faces. Hi, Glenn. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> Sherry Joander says, could you barter something or was it strictly money to buy coffins? I'm sure there was services bartered as well. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe a mechanic is getting a car uh, coffin and then is also like, you know, fixing a vehicle. I think that's a huge part of culture there. In fact, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, can you, uh, Robin Rosenbluth is asking, can you say more about your time with the family? What did you learn there about being in someone's home in a Ghanaian family? Yeah, that that was um, one of the parts that touched me and moved me the most when I was there. Of course, I was glad to be working in the shop and picking up all of these cool new ideas and skills and and ways of, of navigating uh, woodworking. But um, 
yeah, like my relationship with Gifty, um, you know, we became sisters, you know, we um, send each other love all the time, but being in her home, you know, I slept in her bed, like there was no other bed. She just said, here, sleep here. And we both, and that was what I did. And it made me feel a little bit like, oh, can I do this? This is so much personal space and wondered if I could feel comfortable with it, but she was comfortable and I was comfortable and we just shared space like that. And I found it so touching that she opened that up to me and was like very gracious and uh, in doing so. And so I wanted to make sure I was a good host and just went along with what was what. And so we'd do dishes together. We'd wash clothes together. We'd, um, she would, you know, teach me how to make a meal. We would go out for beers. So, and she worked, she worked all day. So I would go to her. Um, she did like cosmetics and like wig products in one of her shops she has her own little shop. And so I'd go there at the end and we'd sit and watch soap operas and have a beer. And it was, I didn't know what the soap was about, but um, it was, we, we had a great time. And, and by the end, we, we just were like pals, just best friends. So of course it's very hard to maintain that, that closeness over distance and over time. But um, I just heard from her the other day and, and it just, you know, makes your heart just, you know, get excited and um be grateful so yeah that's wonderful well thank you ellie mm -hmm. um i just just you're so inspiring and it's so fun to see how your work has evolved over the last 10 years almost 10 years yeah and congratulations on the birth of your son last thank month you. right is he, a, is he a month old yet i can't believe that no i because yeah we only brought him home just like almost a week ago but um but he's was born on November 18th and we're thrilled to have him. And um, thank you. Yeah, uh, Kristen is definitely getting to watch me grow up here a little bit. Ellie's like superwoman. So she has a baby who has a lecture in the same month and looks just fine. Like you've slept. How's that? Uh, <laughs> no, we're, I have a lot of help. Mom, mom and granddad and my partner Miles are, are all at home with Otis and- um, Wonderful. We're super happy. So thank you. Yeah. And thanks to Zoom, you know, like it's, it's okay. I'm just, you know, I'm not very far away and I love that this opportunity exists and thank you for it. Yes. And if anybody's interested in taking Ellie's class at Peters Valley, she's going to be teaching make and weave a shaker stool on July 15th and 18th. And you can register by going to petersvalley.org. And thank I'm sure you can embellish your chair, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll have, we'll get down and dirty and yeah, use color because you have to. Well, thank you so much. And thank, thank you everyone for tuning in um, and happy holidays and happy new year. And just, it's great to see you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.